the essential question, what is the Enlightenment and how did it change history? And you really uh, can't do one without the other. If we're going to ask what was the Enlightenment, we want to look at how it changed history. First of all, let's look at what enlightened thought is. Enlightened, of course, shedding the light on something. It is uh, giving you education. It is giving you uh, new ideas. And so the Enlightenment of the 18th century referred to the belief that Europe had emerged from a time of barbarism. And something that is barbaric, you know, it's old-fashioned, it's out of, out of date, it is crude, and Enlightenment then would refer to a new way of thinking. Enlightened thought could shed light on old problems, and Europe could emerge from the darkness of medieval times. And that was the thought. So the uh, Renaissance is kind of the beginning of ushering in new thought. Reformation definitely changed philosophy and the way people looked. And now enlightened thought is going to uh, hit the sciences. Um, before we get to the sciences, we look at some natural laws. Natural laws could be science, but we're really looking at social science here, like sociology and uh, political science. Uh, there was a belief in natural laws that were right for all people, and this became a concept that was discussed. In other words, there were just things that were right for all people, no matter where you live, no matter what kind of government you had. And a real belief in the idea of progress became almost universal. Um, whereas in the Dark Ages, the medieval times, things kind of just stayed as they were and stagnated, and in some cases it even went backward. Um, the idea of natural law and progress is going to be that we can get better. We should improve. Uh, things should be better down the road. And, of course, this all starts with educated people. Um, we've already talked about the philosophes. Philosophes are writers. Uh, they were a group of writers who wrote for the populace as a whole. It's usually said that they were popularizers and published and so they also got themselves published. And that was a big deal because there were a lot of people who talked philosophy and were very popular, but if they didn't get their work done in writing, they were forgotten and their ideas were forgotten over time. And their ideas were spread throughout the salons of France. Now remember the salons, uh, those were the get togethers, uh, the kind of coffee and rolls that people would invite people to in their house. And the whole idea here was to show off your intellect. And they wanted to invite interesting people and sit and discuss the ideas at the time. Kind of a different concept. Kind of the coffee shop, except uh, on a much higher philosophical level. The Enlightenment uh, was chiefly expressed in the French language, and France is where it started. Whereas the Renaissance, starting in Italy, the Enlightenment really started in France. It was secular, although some philosophes were religious. We will go through that, and we already have some of the main people and their beliefs on religion. But remember, secular means not having to do with the church. It preached toleration uh, of lifestyles. No, not every lifestyle, but toleration of lifestyles and most specific, uh, specifically, toleration of religion. So uh, you could be any religion and be tolerated. Now, even that, there were limits. Okay, But especially with, we just got done with the wars of religion, and no problem with Lutheran, Catholic, and Calvinist. Um, some of the other religions, however, not as tolerant of. Enlightened thinkers generally believed in progress, reason, science, and civilization. So look at those one at a time. They believe we should be moving forward. People should progress. You believed, uh, They believed you use reason to solve problems, not hearsay, not old wives' tales. And they believed in science. Science and its laws could solve issues, heal people, and, you know, come up with how the universe worked. And then civilization, that uh, over time we should be less barbaric, more civilized. In other words, it wasn't okay 
to beat people and kill people and uh, mistreat people. Um, we would uh, go hopefully to a place uh, where those things were not accepted. But enlightened thinkers, being individuals, also took divergent and inconsistent positions on some items, and you'll find great disagreement among the philosophers. Montesquieu, for example, thought the church was useful but did not believe in religion, so for him the church was a useful social tool. It got people together, it allowed them to socialize, it brought unity, but he did not believe in religion, did not uh, believe that uh, you needed to have an organized religion. Rousseau believed in religion, but he saw no need for any church, so he believed in God, um, he believed it was an individual thing, but he didn't believe that you needed to have a church or belong to a church. Voltaire would surrender political liberty in return for guarantees of intellectual freedom. Um, Voltaire was probably the most uh, profound of the philosophes, and he said, you give me this uh, um, intellectual freedom where I can write what I want, and I'll give up something on the political end as far as rights goes. And one of the big groups of the Enlightenment uh, for change was the Freemasons. The Freemasons were um, a group uh, that formed, and it was kind of like a secret society. Many of the Freemason groups had secret passwords and handshakes and all that kind of thing. Uh, they met in secret behind closed doors. You would have to have an invitation to go to the meetings. And there were many rituals that were formed at Freemason meetings, some of them pretty weird. Um, you know, sometimes they wore um, sheets over their head or, you know, masks or something like that, so people did not know their uh, identity. They believed in reason, and they believed in progress, so that fits perfect with the Enlightenment. And humane reforms and religious toleration were championed. So they wanted people to be humane, kind to one another. Um, they also believed that you could worship whatever you wanted as far as religion goes. And they pushed that idea. And they were respectful of God. The Freemasons actually, um, most of them believed in God. Uh, they weren't, weren't necessarily what we would call Christians today. To be a Christian it really means, you know, you believe that Jesus was the Son of God and he came to earth to to uh, save us uh, from our sins, and it was God's sacrifice to send his son to die for us. But uh, they were more what we call deists. Deists believed in a supreme being. They believed that God created the he heavens and the earth, but then he was kind of like the intelligent watchmaker. He would sit back and wind his watch, in this case the earth, let it uh, go, and then um, watch. He did not uh, interact, he did not interfere, but he admired his work and watched. Montesquieu was a very influential uh, writer, and his doctrine uh, about good governments is probably the most important thing that he did. And um, his whole idea here was you could design good governments. He believed in separation of powers, that is the concept that we took from uh, Montesquieu for the American uh, form of government. Um, should not have uh, the three powers, you know, combined. They should be separated. Okay. And what are those three powers? His belief was that a separate executive, that would be your leader, legislative, your lawmakers, and judicial, your courts, would create the best government. So um, a lot of our American government was, uh, you know, created by Montesquieu's ideas. This would then create a system of checks and balances. So he's also very much associated with the idea of checks and balances, that um, no one branch become too powerful. The other two would be the, the balance, and they would check the power of the uh, any branch. Uh, Voltaire, um, he was uh, kind of a tongue-in-cheek writer, kind of like Erasmus. He uh, wrote a whole lot of things in which he kind of made fun of people and events. Um, but he was also very serious at times. And his famous polemic 
political slogan was Écraser l'infâme, French, which meant crush the infamous thing. And I've seen this as one of the questions on the uh, final at the end of the years. What was meant by la crasse l'infâme? What was the infamous thing that should be crushed? Well, he was referring to religious bigotry and superstition as one. So crush bigotry. In other words, my religion is better than yours. Yours is not important. And superstition, which uh, unfortunately superstition was used a lot to convict people in the courts back then. And uh, he said, no, we got to base it on reason. Um, Voltaire was a satirist who made fun of the establishment. So like I said, in the same realm as Erasmus of Rotterdam, Voltaire made fun of people, events, and um, governments. Rousseau, uh, sometimes called the father of sociology, in a way uh, he was, he believed that a social contract exists among the people themselves. So his whole idea was that um, this social contract tied leaders to their people. And the idea behind the social contract is that the people owed the leader something. They owed him their allegiance. They would follow. The uh, leader owed his people something, that he would do the best for them, protect them, give them the best laws that he could. So within the social contract, all individuals fuse their wills into a combined general will. So if you ever heard that term general will, that means all people who take part, in other words, all citizens of a country, would have a general will. They don't all agree on everything but you have a general will. In an ideal society, every person could feel that he or she belonged. All would have a sense of membership and participation because they felt that they uh, belonged because they got to vote. They got to, you know, elect their um, leaders. And they had a sense of membership and participation because of that. Rousseau contributed to the French Revolution by causing the upper classes to lose faith in their own superiority because of his ideas of the general will and the social contract, um, he started to make the uh, elite upper class in France lose the whole idea that they were superior to the masses. And because of him and his uh, writings, many um, of the upper class in France are going to leave France. They're going to start to um, wonder if their form of government is the best. Adam Smith also had a big part in uh, American system. He wrote a book of economics called Wealth of Nations in 1776, catch the year there, kind of famous in American history. And he believed that an invisible hand would guide the economy. His idea of the invisible hand is that once set in motion, prices would be determined by this invisible hand, supply and demand. Um, supply would never get so big uh, because demand would take care of that. If you end up with a whole lot of supply, your price is going to go down. If you don't have enough of something, your price is going to go up. That's, that's Adam Smith. He wanted a reduction of barriers that hindered economic growth, so he wanted to get rid of tariffs. He wanted to get rid of trade barriers at borders and things like that. And his main belief was in laissez-faire economics. You'll notice all the big keywords of the time are in French, and that was uh, laissez-faire means hands off, leave alone. Um, and in economics, that means no <clears throat> government shouldn't be involved. The government should not be much involved in economics. Let um, supply and demand be determined by the market. And uh, during the Enlightenment, we come to a new form of ruling called enlightened despotism. A despot is a ruler who's a one-person ruler, um, could be like a dictator, <clears throat> but a despot really means one person has all the power. However, enlightened means that you're with it, you want to change, you're looking at what's best for the people. And... This is going to grow out of earlier absolutism. Absolutism is the monarchy, absolute monarchy, king and queen. And um, <clears throat> the king and queen was okay if you had a good king or queen that cared about their people. You guys saw in uh, the Cromwell movie and studying about Cromwell that the kings didn't always do that. Kings many times were out for themselves. Um, and this differed from its predecessors by justifying his authority on grounds of usefulness to society. So the enlightened despots 
they didn't just say divine right of kings, I'm ruling because God chose me. They're instead saying, I have authority on the grounds of my usefulness to society. I'm here to protect you. I'm here to give you better laws. I'm here to help you improve, progress. The king and the people had a relationship, a social contract, and the king had to do its best for his people. The people respected the king and supported him. I'll give you an example here. The aristocracy had uh, internal liberties in Poland. They had all kinds of liberties, all kinds of freedoms that the lower classes did not. The lower classes so had none of these, and they felt left out. Poland had no strong central government. Um, they uh, were very weak, and it's one reason that they're going to be dismembered. Latin was their official language, so at a time when other countries are using a native language, um, they're still sticking with Latin, so they are out of touch. They even appointed foreign kings. They did not feel that <laughs> there should be a, there, there had never had been a Polish line of kings. And they did not feel that um, the Polish people, I guess, were worthy of having a king with all of the trappings. And so they appointed foreign kings. They would get people from the uh, ruling families of other countries. And they had a cosmopolitan aristocracy that had all the power. So the, the cosmopolitan means, of course, that you uh, can travel and go around the world. Um, they were in, you know, they were in the mainstream. Um, and that was only the aristocrats because the poor in Poland were the opposite. They were, um, you know, very much stay at home, don't travel. Uh, many of them were very shut in uh, and did not know about what was going on in the world. And because of power politics, <clears throat> Poland, as weak because of how weak they were, um, is going to be divided three times. And there you see the map of the partitions of Poland. In 1772, 1793, 1795, Poland was divided each time losing land. Uh, who did they lose it to? Russia, Austria, Prussia, all took chunks of Poland. So the main beneficiaries, again, Russia, Prussia, and Austria. And uh, Poland is going to disappear from the map in 1795. Okay, And big country, it's got good agriculture, it's got minerals and everything. No reason that Poland could not have been a power and done very well. But their government was a shambles and very weak. So now what I want you guys to do is please write your summary for this um, chapter and this lecture. Um, one more word on enlightened despotism. Some people felt that this is the highest form of government you could have. Enlightened despotism, you had a strong monarch, uh, leader who cared about his people, wanted to pass good laws, wanted to progress and keep up on things. And, you know, how could you ask for anything more? Uh, in some people's eyes.